Surprisingly, when I looked at the clinical trial data on um, behavior therapy, it's actually not a very good treatment for treating the symptoms of ADHD. Now, the, the neurodiversity movement raises, it does raise some important questions, which one question is, for example, why can't the world accommodate to people that are a little different? There's no um, break point between people with ADHD and people without ADHD when you look at their genes, when you look at their brains, when you look at their neuropsychology, fill, fill in the blank. We know from lots of research that if you have one mental health problem, you are at increased risk for having another one. If you look on the scale of like all medical treatments, the treatments for ADHD are as good or better than most medical treatments. world-renowned psychologist. I mean, incredible. Let's see if it'll work. Uh, if you want to ask him questions today, you just have to send in a super chat or bits. I will do all alerts at the Hooray, end. we're back in business. Hey! <laughs> You're muted, yes. Yes, yes. How's it going? It's working. Uh, it's, uh, my frustration is over. I don't know what... Well, I hate to I hate to seem like a befuddled older person, but I am usually much better. I'm actually pretty good with computers. <laughs> yeah, you're, uh, you're you're leaning into the stereotype a little bit today. I know, <laughs> but this is the first time I I literally because normally I, I like I actually I because my computer was a little buggy, so I said I better restart it before I talk to. Is it Kyla or Kayla? Kayla. Kyla. Kyla. Yep. Kyla. Uh, before I talk to Kyla, because I wanted to be everything to be working well, so I restarted the computer, and that's the first time in my life has made things worse <laughs> so a new record there well it worked out it worked out super well well thank you so much um just so you know we are live right now um but obviously okay. nothing spicy has happened um i've let the chat know basically that they can ask you questions at the end um so we'll save okay. a bunch of community questions towards the end just confirming did we have an hour or an hour and a half today i wasn't quite sure what we confirmed on uh, how, how much time do you need you we can I can give you an hour and a half if you need it. If we go in, <laughs> we'll see how we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, you give me as much time, and then as I say, like if you run out of spoons or get tired or anything, just let me know. We can cut. Okay. It off. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so I've all through school have been reading your research. Um, been Ooh. very very Thank aware you. of your research, as I'm sure as I'm reading in chat many people are you're kind of like a psychology superstar in a lot of ways as i was trying to explain to chat um how long have you been in the field what got you interested give us some preamble of like who you are and why we should care about what you say okay well uh i'm a clinical psychologist um i've been uh and by, by being a clinical psychologist i was trained to both treat patients and do research in uh, mental disorders and I, I actually stopped treating patients late in the 1990s because I, I became more interested in the research side and thought I could actually thought I could contribute more to the field by being a full-time researcher than by, because there were lots of, lots of really good clinicians, but I was a really good researcher. I thought I'm going to do that. Um, I've been doing it, I guess, probably for about, I would say 30, 35 years. I've been focused on ADHD and that started back um, in the mid 1980s. I was a junior faculty at Harvard, mm -hmm. and I actually was at the time, and this is a lesson for younger people, that uh, career paths aren't always straight. Sometimes the crooked path gets you to a place that is a better place mm -hmm. uh, and that you're not expecting. Uh, and I was um, working at the time as a, uh, first I was a psychology intern at uh, Butler Hospital, Brown University, and doing work uh, in psychological treatments for schizophrenia. And at the time, I was trying to figure out what to do, what my next path would be, and I was thinking I would get a position as a, in a you know, in a psychology department in a university because that's what most of my mentors had done. And then I ran across a, a young colleague who said, "Oh, there's an opening in Professor Ming Swang's lab. I think you'd, I think you'd be interested in it." Mm -hmm. And I said, "Why do you think that?" And he said, "Well, just talk to him. He's a fascinating person." And uh, Professor Swang uh, was indeed a very fascinating person. He was he was studying um, genetics of schizophrenia and, and bipolar disorder mm -hmm. uh, and convinced me to kind of move a little bit outside of my psychology comfort area into a, a, an area that was mental health, but a little bit different in genetics. And so we did that. And then I was working with him. There was another colleague. Uh, then we all moved up to Harvard. The whole team moved up to Harvard. And um, one of the other... Uh, young faculty members at, at Harvard 
was studying ADHD and he needed advice about genetics. So he came to our team and I got really intrigued with ADHD as a disorder mm -hmm. and also as the potential for helping people because as a very early onset condition, uh, it is presages other things. And if you can kind of stop things early, you can help other problems not emerge later. And it's really because of that, I got interested in ADHD and I kind of moved my career in that direction. But it wasn't where I thought I would be going when I graduated from, you know, from my PhD back in 1982. <laughs> so I'm kind of surprised to be where I am today. The last thing I thought is that I'd be in a medical school studying child psychiatric disorders. That's so interesting. Yeah. And it's interesting to see, see even kind of your shift away from clinical work because uh, I think most people would agree. I mean, your age index is by itself kind of speaks for itself of just the contributions that you've made uh, to the field, specifically in research. I remember in all my clinical psych courses, um, one of my my undergrad thesis uh, supervisor was a clinical psychologist, and he was like, "If you're ever wondering about ADHD, stay in Stephen Fairwin's camp. Just read his papers. <laughs> he does like the best research in clinical psych that I've seen, like basically out there." Um, so I'm super super honored to have you on here today. Um, Let's maybe start with super basic stuff for the audience of just like common myths sure. about ADHD. What is it? How do we diagnose it? Just like the basic stuff. Sure, sure. Um, basics, it's it's defined, people have to separate out the, the definition of ADHD from other features, first of all, and that's extremely important. ADHD is defined by symptoms of inattention, being distractible, um, looking at the window, daydreaming, things like that, impulsivity, acting without thinking, you know, running into the street after a ball, not looking for cars, um, and uh, of course, hyperactivity. That's the classic symptom, the, the hyperactive child running around, climbing on furniture. Um, those symptoms of hyperactivity tend to attenuate, uh, even with impulsivity, attenuate some, somewhat as people with ADHD age, but the symptoms remain persistent into adulthood in about two thirds of the cases. Um, there are other features of ADHD that are some of them, is the, the, there's debates about whether it's, if you will, a core part of the disorder or an impairment that's caused by the disorder. But one set of features that's really important uh, is uh, emotional dysregulation. People with ADHD, for example, can be quick-tempered. You can think, almost think about it as emotional impulsivity. Um, and many of us think they should be diagnostic criteria. We can talk more about that later if you're interested in. And then there's all sorts of impairments that people with ADHD can suffer from other problems that aren't ADHD, but are linked in some way to their ADHD. And those other conditions can be psychiatric conditions. They can be uh, adverse outcomes, such as doing poorly in school, not doing well in jobs, um, not doing well in relationships. And the list goes on. And I don't like to you know, hammer away too hard on that list because sometimes that seems demoralizing to people with ADHD. Oh my gosh, there's all these things that happen to me. Mm -hmm. And what I say is, well, all of these risks are real. And any one person with ADHD is... Um, may experience one or, or more of them, but with appropriate treatment, they can avoid, all these risks can be avoided. So it shouldn't be seen as hopeless. It should be seen as there's a lot of hope for people with the disorder. Yeah, I think appropriate treatment's a really interesting question and it links right to one of the questions I had prepped. How do you, what are the appropriate treatments for ADHD? A lot of people in the comment section that was building up before you came on had a ton of questions about treatment that's non-medicated for ADHD. Yeah, it's the in some ways it's the holy grail now of ADHD research is to find a good uh, non pharmacologic treatment, a good non medical treatment for the disorder. Um, that search has been difficult. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist and I treated loads of families and kids with behavior therapy when I was an active clinician, and those therapies are useful for all, all sorts of things. But surprisingly, when I looked at the clinical trial data on um, behavior therapy, it's actually not a very good treatment for treating the symptoms of ADHD. Mm -hmm. It seemed, and I was surprised to learn that, but it's actually true. Um, so for kids, and, and it's for that reason, for kids, the first line treatment is uh, is, med is, me is medical treatment, is, is, is medicines. Um, after that, there are other things that can be done and should be done. But um, it, I, I've heard, you know, from too many, you know, parents really, uh, when I was treating kids, that they, you know, they tried lots of other non-medical treatments first, and then when they finally tried medical treatments, they were like, oh my gosh, why didn't I do this three years ago? I mean, this is my life is, I mean, they, they're sometimes, not always because every patient is different, but the medical treatments are sometimes literally transformative, both for kids and adults where, I mean, it's, they, well, they'll be like, wow, my, you know, I didn't know life could be this way. I didn't know I could be this person. 
Yeah, you even see that like reflected, like one thing that's always so interesting to me is to see uh, ADHD kids pre and post medication with like neuropsych testing and cognitive assessment batteries because of just the jump in scores um, on like specifically like things to do with like impulsivity control, like inhibitions and stuff like that. That, that's right. That's right. So it, it, to get back to non-pharmacologic treatments, there, is, there, there are some things, for example, it turns out that omega-3 fatty acid supplementation has a very has a small but real effect in ADHD. That's a real treatment. Um, when I say small, you know, we index things by something called the effect size, or the, in this case, the standardized mean difference. And for say, a stimulant medication, that, that, that number is about 0.9, or let's say on a scale of one to 10, it's nine for a Omega three, it's two. Okay. So the two is it's a real two. We can you know there's lots of studies, meta analysis, good control trials, but it's only it's only a two. Now that means that you know some people might do really well on it because you know the, we're not means. No one's a mean. We're all an individual. But on average, it's not going to be the best the best treatment. Um, but other treatments, oddly enough, haven't panned out. I mean, people have written a lot about diet, and there's all sorts of diets for ADHD, and people thought ADHD kids are hypersensitive to this and to that. Um, but the diet literature hasn't panned out. Um, there've been all sorts of fancy neurofeedback treatments, working memory treatments. Some that have been helpful though. though. Let's, so let me talk, I can, what I can say is that there's a lot of um, flim flam about treatments for ADHD. On the other hand, there are some that seem uh, especially hopeful. So there's a new device uh, out uh, it's called, uh, it's, it does what's called trigeminal nerve stimulation. Mm. And um, surprisingly enough, if one stimulates a trigeminal nerve in a certain way with a certain treatment protocol, uh, a colleague of mine at UCLA, uh, Dr. Jim McGuff and his colleague, Sandy Liu, uh, found that this, this treatment reduces the symptoms of ADHD in a very real way in a good control, good control trial. Uh, so there's actually, there's actually this device is now marketed by a company called uh, Monarch, I think. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The, I think the device is called Monarch. The company is called Neurosigma. Um, and uh, it's been cleared by the FDA as being being useful for treating ADHD. And um, not everything cleared by the FDA is as good as one might think, but this is good. This is actually um, has has a real effect. Trigeminal um, nerve, just to make sure I'm understanding, that's is that the fifth cranial nerve? Like, is that does it yes, run it, surface? Yes, that's exactly, exactly. Yeah, okay. And um, I'm not completely up on the neurobiology of, but there's some reasonable mechanistic studies suggest that when stimulating that nerve, you are stimulating deeper centers of the brain that can um, then have a therapeutic effect. Uh, there's some data on transcranial, transcranial direct magnetic stimulation. I may have gotten the words mixed up there because it's a, it's a mouthful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, those data aren't quite as good because not as well controlled yet, but there's some preliminary trials suggesting that they might be useful. So I say, stay tuned for that. That might be um, really good. And there's a, another product by a company called Achille called Endeavor RX, uh, which is the game that you play to treat ADHD. I don't know if you've heard about that one. And this is also FDA cleared, but it's it's um, a little bit different. The, the FDA uh, clearance or approval is uh, for treating symptoms of inattention, or I should say neuropsychological signs of inattention in ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, it hasn't been shown to actually do uh, dramatically reduce ADHD symptoms. Although having participated in the trials, there, there, seem, there seemed to be some reduction in the symptoms, but it wasn't big enough to be what we say is statistically significant. So um, uh, the company really can't sell it as, as such. That's kind of one alternative that some parents turn to when they, when they don't want medication. Um, but uh, I wouldn't suggest that, um, you know, without... One thing I would always suggest to parents, if you want, want to go the route of a non-pharmacologic treatment, that's okay, but don't spend too much time on that because right. every year your child is not appropriately treated, they are learning the wrong things and they are not learning some things. And what happens is that you, if they're three and you, you know, and you don't get them adequate treatment until they're six, that's half their life is spent in, in a very difficult situation. And that's not a good thing. Right. It seems um, like medication still at this point is almost like glasses. Like it's just, it's kind of the most easy, simple, direct measure of it, treating it. It's, it's a great analogy. It absolutely is. I'll, I'll just tell you one simple story. So a friend of mine calls me up like a few years ago and says, uh, it's actually my family lawyer. He says, hey, you know, I know you work in ADHD. Would you mind talking to my daughter about my grandson? And I said, well, well, 
oh, sure, I'll talk to her, you know, but why? <laughs> well, it turns out he, he says, I'm pretty sure he has ADHD. He's got problems. And she's been taking him to every kind of natural naturopathic treatment possible. Mm -hmm. And it's been like th two, three years. And I don't see any changes. She seems to think that it might, it's working. And I said, I'll talk to her. And I talked to her and, you know, she explained her concerns about medication. And, you know, I explained, well, geez, these medications have been used for 40 or 50 years. They're really, you know, they're known to be safe. They've, they're used in older people for lethargy. You know, you, some of the most vulnerable people are people that are 80, 90 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, they're using them. Uh, okay. I said, look, here's what you can do. If you agree to do it, do this with your physician, it doesn't mean you agree to it for life. You know, you could stop after the first day if you thought, oh my God, this is terrible. You can just stop it. Yeah. Why don't you just try it for a few days? Uh, I mean, they'll give you a prescription for at least a week. Mm -hmm. Give it a try. I would suggest at least a week and see what happens. So she does it. She does it. And I get a call a week later saying, literally, oh my God, I wish I had done this three years ago. I mean, he's a, he's a totally different person in terms of the behavioral problems that he was experiencing. And that's not an unusual story. Um, it's, it's not an unusual story. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite crazy. Um, just like the efficacy of, of the treatment itself. Um, one question we had, so ADHD has been, how long has the diagnosis just been in the DSM and kind of acknowledged as a, a disorder yeah, of mental illness? It's more okay, well, developmental, but yeah. So I'm going to go back a little further in history just to help okay. people because I, the reason I do this is because some people think, oh, you know, AD, I mean, literally the anti-psychiatry movement says ADHD was invented by psychiatrists to fund the fund pharmaceutical companies. So it was just this cabal between the American psychologists and pharmaceutical companies. I hope that's paying it's, off for you. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish it was. <laughs> but it turns, it turns out that if you, the first description in the medical text that is clearly hit a kid with ADHD, although they didn't call it that, that was in the late 18th century in a German textbook, hmm. I think it was 1798 or something like that. Um, a few years after that, a similar description occurred in a Scottish textbook. This, these are medical texts. We're not talking about someone just writing in their letters to some home or something. And then the first appearance in an academic journal wasn't until actually the 19, I think it was 1901, Dr. George Still is accredited with that. And the stimulant medications people that people know colloquially as Ritalin and Adderall, but we call them the generically stimulant medications. The first stimulant medication was, um, well, the efficacy of stimulant medications, uh, an amphetamine, was actually discovered in 1937 in Providence, Rhode Island by Dr. Charles Bradley, hmm. who he discovered it by mistake because he thought he was actually doing some, he was doing some, uh, you know, what kind of studies, doing some studies of kids in this hospital for really disturbed kids. And he thought, gee, he says, these, he says, I, I need to uh, give these kids something to, um, you know, I forgot what his rationale was, but for some reason he had a rationale that he needed to give them an amphetamine. Mm -hmm. And so he gave them the amphetamine and it seemed to do what he wanted them to do. Uh, but it wasn't for ADHD. It wasn't for anything like that. And then <clears throat> a few days later, the teachers come to him. It was, it was this um, day school. Teachers come to him and said, Dr. Bradley, what did you do to these kids? They're so much better. Yeah. And he discovered just by total luck that amphetamine treats symptoms of ADHD. In fact, the kids in the school, they would call it the math pill. They would say, oh, Dr. Bradley, I need another math pill. <laughs> I'm doing poorly in my studies. <laughs> yeah. But that, anyway, that was 1937. So this was not a, some kind of invention by a, a, a cabal of psychiatrists. This was just pure dumb luck that this was discovered. But your question about the actual diagnosis, mm -hmm. um, the first diagnosis was really the DSM-2, which was in the 1960s. And that was a very vague diagnosis. It really was not very descriptive. And it was, it was hard to hard to get two people to agree what exactly was and wasn't ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until around 1982 that the, uh, the third edition of the diagnostic manual came out. And we had what I'm sure you know are very well-structured diagnostic criteria. And back then, unfortunately, it was called attention deficit disorder with or without hyperactivity, became known as ADD. And so that still exists in the Twitter sphere and everywhere on social media, people talk about ADD. Uh, although nowadays we, the, the name changed ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder for whatever complex reasons, but it's actually the same disorder. Um, mm -hmm. the, the criteria have, have evolved somewhat, but not so dramatically that they're um, the, the disorder is any different than it was back in the 1980s. 
Okay. Well, that leads, I mean, everyone is always wondering why. Why did ADD and ADHD get combined and kind of turned into one diagnosis? It became one diagnosis because we found, first of all, if you if you do uh, anyone has done a you know population study or even a clinical study of kids with ADHD, they find well, number one kids that are just first of all there are two general classes of symptoms. There's I said I mentioned three classes, but hyperactive and impulsive symptoms tend to go together, and inattentive symptoms tend to hang a little bit apart from that. So there are there are some kids and adults that are just really inattentive, they don't have much hyperactivity or impulsivity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's almost nobody who's just hyperactive and impulsive. And most of the people have both sets of symptoms. Uh, and we also know that the symptom pictures tend to change over time. So at one visit, a kid might look like they're basically just inattentive, but then you see them you know, the next year and there you see symptoms of hyperactive and impulsivity. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why the... Um, essentially sort of dropped the uh, idea, the idea that there were two types of ADHD. There had been, you know, back in the 80s, lots of us, myself included, um, I like to say that um, the nice thing about research is that you get to make a lot of mistakes, but you get to correct them <laughs> if you do it long enough. <laughs> and, and one of the mistakes I made was to think that they really were these very separate subtypes of ADHD. Mm. Uh, and uh, one type of subtype was with and without hyperactivity. Turned out that's wrong, that was wrong. And, and we have ways of studying. When I say, why do I say it's wrong? I say it's wrong because we find that, for example, the subtypes change over time. Mm. Or, and those subtypes, they don't tend to go together in a family. So if one, one child has inattentive ADHD, the next one might have uh, what we call combined type ADHD with, with all the symptoms. So we, we tend not to talk about subtypes anymore when it comes to it. Well, at least I, I don't talk about them anymore, uh, for sure. Okay. So I know I was reading one paper, I believe of yours, that was talking about kind of, it was a factorial analysis of basically arguing a bit for this emotional dysregulation bit. I thought you maybe did a factorial analysis. I feel like four factors kind of emerged, which was the inattentive, the hyperactive, the emotional dysregulation. And then I think there was an executive function as well. Is that correct? That sounds right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is that still what we're finding or does that look like it's possibly like five kind of major emerging trends? So yeah, sometimes different, you know, the, those types of analysis somewhat depend upon the sample one's looking at, whether it's population or clinical, but in general, it's, it's fair to say that, that, those sets of symptoms are all very relevant to ADHD. And, and it, it gets us back to the question of what's a kind of a core part of the disorder and what's something different. Mm -hmm. And there are the two that you mentioned there that are kind of in, in the, in currently kind of in the in-between land are symptoms of emotional dysregulation and symptoms of executive dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Now, the way I think about that is I borrow from, um, Russ Barkley, because when I was a graduate student, he was the one that we was told to read <laughs> as being <laughs> the top expert in ADHD. And he became a good friend of mine uh, later in, in my career. And but Russell, um, one of his, um, I, I think, contributions to the to the field is understanding ADHD as primarily the sort of self-regulation. So inability to self-regulate our behavior leads to hyperactivity inability to self-regulate cognition leads to inattention mm. um, um, and inability to, to self-regulate um, impulses leads to impulsivity. And he rightly asked the question, well, inability to regulate, to, to, to regulate emotions leads to emotional dysregulation, but why isn't that a, why isn't that a symptom? Right. And so he, he and I and other people, we've done a bunch of studies of that. And a lot of the data suggests it really is more of a symptom of ADHD rather than an associated feature. And I think it's, an, it's a problem that the diagnostic manual excludes it because particularly in adulthood, you start to see more of these emotional dysregulation symptoms. And so, and, and fewer of the hyperactivity symptoms, and it becomes harder for adults to meet diagnostic criteria because we, we're basically using criteria that were created for kids yeah. with some, some recent tweaks in the DSM-5 to make them more friendly for adults. Um, but they're just tweaks. They're really not um, having to address that. And the same goes for the executive dysfunction. We, you, you know, so the executive, I mean, as you know, the executive dysfunction, these are functions of the brain that are the highest level of functions we have run by our frontal lobes, which aren't really even fully developed until we're adults. And so we, those symptoms of executive dysfunction are, are more evident in adults right. than they are in kids, although you can measure them in kids for sure. Right. Okay. That's super interesting. So 
I think testing for ADHD is a really, really interesting conversation because the diagnosis conversation is fascinating around ADHD, right? Obviously, there isn't a clear biomarker for ADHD. Mm -hmm. Should I say yet? Or is there, because I've heard about things like NCII and HRV, so like heart rate variability. Do any of these to you seem like a potential for diagnosis as well? Or So there's always, I mean, I, I never say no to potential, right? This, I've learned from science. Science can take us places that we never expect to be. So the, in the future, I I would I would expect that eventually we will discover some useful, it probably will be a set of biomarkers rather than one, but we will find some biomarker for ADHD. We currently don't have any. What we have are, there are lots of biological features that are, um, let's say, more um, that, that you can measure that are different in people with ADHD as a group from people without ADHD. But when you try to use that for classification, it falls apart. They're just not good at all right. for, the, for that purpose. Okay. So heart rate variability at an individual level is just, it's not enough to really tease it. it exactly, exactly. Okay. So then I know a lot of people like they talk about getting a diagnosis of ADHD and they go to their GP, they get a self-report, they fill it out and they walk out with an ADHD diagnosis. Um, I hear that and I'm always like, man, ADHD can look like a lot, like anxiety can look like ADHD if you've got like some of the uh, inattention and like impulsivity and stuff like that. And depression can sometimes map onto some of these symptoms. What is kind of the empirically sound way to be testing for ADHD? Well, so you, you've, the important thing you said there was GP. And uh, uh, there are so many, uh, we have to think differently about kids and adults. So for example, with kids, pediatricians have for decades been, been diagnosing and treating ADHD. They know how to do it very well. The American Academy of Pediatrics has guidelines. And I think I would say for the most part, pediatricians are doing a pretty good job with uh, diagnosing ADHD. Mm -hmm. It's it, it, it's different for, for adults. Remember, pediatricians, they also have, a, the parents are a captive audience in the process. So they not only have access to the kid, but they also can talk to the parents about what's going on and so forth. Mm -hmm. it, with adults, it's a, a different story because with adults, um, there aren't enough psychiatrists in the country to treat all the adults with ADHD. And some adults with ADHD live in places where there are no psychiatrists. So general practitioners need to step up and and do that. And in fact, um, we try to train general practitioners at ADHDandadults.com where we do continuing medical medical education programs uh, for uh, primary care. When I say primary care, I'm talking also about nurse practitioners who are bearing a lot of the burden these days of uh, mental health care in general, but also certainly for ADHD. Um, the problem we have with primary care is that they have very little time to actually interact with patients. We all know this. We see our doctors nowadays, right? Or nurse practitioners. They're not, they don't spend an hour with us usually. They spend much less time with us. Um, so, you know, we, and I say we as a community, you know, we try to find ways to help primary care people make better diagnoses. So for example, the American, American Academy of Family Practice has a, an adult ADHD toolkit uh, where they um, help in that process. But the, the only way to really make a diagnosis is that the clinician has to ask the patient questions that are relevant to the 18 diagnostic items in the DSM. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to just give them a piece of paper and, ch and, and check things off because we know that will lead to overdiagnosis of ADHD. Uh, it's extremely important. Um, and because we there's a lot of talk about what the symptoms are of the, dis of the disorder. And in fact, I forget because I didn't, I didn't, haven't even mentioned it yet, but it's always important that clinicians take into account that the disorder is not just a bundle of symptoms. It's a group of symptoms that cause serious impairment in the person's life. Right. It's a group of it's a group of impairments and symptoms that occur in more than one place. There's no such thing as ADHD that just occurs when I'm with my wife or ADHD that just occurs when I'm at work. It's a perva it, it's pervasive in one's life and it causes impairment. And we know from from epidemiologic studies that if you exclude an impairment criterion, you, you, you'll double your rate of ADHD diagnoses because there are, for some reason, lots of kids, you know, who have high levels of symptoms but are not impaired and don't have don't have a disorder. Right. Yeah, the impairment piece is interesting. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with like the neurodivergence literature that's kind of propping I, up on. I, I am. It's an inter It's a fascinating literature. Yes, I'm glad you'd like to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'm working in a lab that actually studies FASD. So obviously, we've got a really weird relationship with ND research and and 
discourse as well because it's it's a preventable brain injury essentially yeah um i know a lot of people have issues with the impairment piece uh of diagnosis um could you just speak a little bit more as to like why it's important that a diagnosis is attached to the impairment because a lot of people like this characterizes my life so much it helps me understand myself why wouldn't i just like self-diagnose and give myself the diagnosis it characterizes me perfectly uh because that's someone who's saying adhd is part of my personality so i i like that for some reason and i'm, I'm going to say that i have adhd because i do all these things um well one reason is that and this is why there's a lot of things to talk about here <laughs> i have to get back to neurodiversity um which we're talking in a way talking about uh and this is, you know, obviously you're talking to somebody who has worked in, in in medical settings for quite a long time now. So maybe I've been, you know, what have, uh, what's the word for it, um, brainwashed by the medical establishment. But the way we tend to think about it and the way people like me are trained to think about it is that uh, a disorder is, something is a disorder when it's causing distress and or disability to somebody and they're in pain and they want help. Mm -hmm. And that's basically why it's a disorder because people have come for treatment for ADHD, they are in pain. They don't come for treatment just because they want to be more attentive. They come because their inattention is causing them awful problems in, in their life. And that's, that's, that's really the reason. It's just, it's pain. It's human pain that needs to be relieved. And that's why, that's why it's a disorder. That's, that, that's why it's not just diversity. Right. It's, it's, it's diversity in a theoretical sense, but it's diversity that you can put a, you can put a label on it as disorder. And I know there's a, there's a lot of, some people say, oh no, you can't label it. You can't label it as a bad thing to do, but I'm sorry. Um, if you don't, well, the other thing is that if you don't label it, if you don't call it a disorder, then guess what? Your insurance companies won't pay for you to see your doctor for it. They won't pay for your medication for it. Right. And then you're, you're, we're really in trouble. So that's a practical reason too. Yeah. It seems like you have quite, probably seems like we would have a lot to talk about with neurodiversity research. Um, because a lot of it talks about this resistance to treatment specifically about how treatment is just trying to like force neurodiverse people into like a neurotypical world. Um, but it feels so dismissive of like so many ADHD people who are like, I don't fit into any world. Like I'm just, I can't focus on anything. I can't get my work done. I'm constantly just like sitting there for hours. And I look back and I'm like, I've done nothing for four hours. I haven't even read a Twitter article. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Now, the, the neurodiversity movement raises, it does raise some important questions, which one question is, for example, why can't the world accommodate to people that are a little different? Mm -hmm. And, okay, I, I, I agree with that general principle. I mean, for example, there are, um, I mean, we all know them. I have actually a good friend who's an adult with an, uh, uh, I would say, a mild autism spectrum disorder. And, you know, people, some people can't tolerate him because they, they have difficulty tolerating differences. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I could tolerate him for all sorts of reasons that because of the other qualities that he brings to the to the table, so to speak. Um, so the neurodiversity movement is good in that sense that they they can communicate to the world, hey, you know, don't just dismiss these people because they're a little unusual. Um, you may be able to accommodate to them and, and they may enrich your life as, as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it doesn't change the fact that some people get to who have, who are neurodiverse well, see, this is where the argument is that they get to the point where it becomes painful and the, the neurodiversity people says, well, it's only painful because society makes it painful for them. Um, but on the other hand, how much can society adapt? So for example, if someone is, is is psychotic and running around, throwing things, yelling at people, should we all just adapt to that person? Right. Or does that person need treatment? I think we would most say that person needs treatment, even even though theoretically we could adapt to that. Right. I think that's a really interesting way of approaching it, actually. I haven't heard that question, which is specifically because I agree, right? I am my roommate's autistic. My dad is actually autistic as well. Um, so I have lots of uh, neurodivergence in my life. Um, and it's a really good question of we should adapt somewhat, right? We shouldn't treat these people poorly just because, like, they communicate right. sometimes a little bit strangely or they might impulsively interrupt you. But also, how much is functionally realistic to adapt? And then how do we bridge the gap between those two things? Exactly, exactly, exactly. We have to, yeah, no, it, it's a really, and the, the other fascinating part about neurodiversity is where they, it is true. I mean, if we look at the latest 
I would say the like the latest genetic data, even the clinical data on ADHD, that there's no um, break point between people with ADHD and people without ADHD when you look at their genes, when you look at their brains, when you look at the neuropsychology, fill, fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. uh, ADHD really is a trait in the population that some people have a lot of, some people have a little of, and some people have none of. And in that sense, the neurodiversity people are right, that it, it really is uh, a divergence from what's neurotypical in a, in a quantitative way as opposed to a qualitative way. For example, it's very much, it's very different from intellectual disability, where there's a, if you look at intelligence scores um, or any measure of, of functioning, um, you've got a distribution like humped in the middle of everybody, most everybody, and then people who are intellectually disabled are way at the bottom, a totally, totally separate group. ADHD is not that way. It's all, you measure symptoms in the population, it's always this normal distribution. You look at polygenic risk, it's a normal distribution. Same thing for brain for the brain functioning. Mm -hmm. But that argument is sometimes used to say, well, therefore it's not a disorder. But then people forget that, you know, well, we have hypertension, you know, everybody has blood pressure, but some people have high blood pressure. They have hypercholesteremia, we have obesity. We have lots of, of well-accepted mental disorders and diseases that are just extremes of, of normal variation. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not a reason to dismiss something as a disorder just because it's it's the extreme of something that's neurotypical or normal. Right. Uh, yeah. um, that maybe leads into an interesting conversation about like self-diagnosis, pop psychology, and kind of myths that are propagated around ADHD in general. Which do you want to tackle first? And do you not want to tackle any any of those three options. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to go one by one and you'll have to remind me about all the okay. options because at my age, I'm not going to remember them okay. all those at the same time. So um, what is it? Self-diagnosis was first? Yeah. Um, well, uh, self-diagnosis uh, could be a very important step into getting a proper diagnosis of ADHD because many, many of us, we go see our primary care doctor. They're not going to ask you questions about ADHD you're never going to get diagnosed with that ADHD unless you go to them and say, I think I have ADHD and here's why. And you explain why. And essentially you give them your self-diagnosis. Right. Now, obviously a competent clinician is going to not just accept that, they're going to do some exploration of that. But I, I do think that self-diagnosis, um, thinking about what introspection is always a good thing, right? I mean, Socrates said, know thyself, right? And mm -hmm. knowing thyself means knowing your diagnoses, knowing your strengths, knowing your weaknesses. So by all means do that. Um, but you can't really be sure about it until a professional who's trained in it can can basically validate your observations. Yeah. Pop psychology. Um, there's a lot of, especially I'm sure you're aware, there's a lot of TikToks and YouTube yes. videos on yes. ADHD. It's a very, very sexy topic. And I saw a study recently that said um, of all the claims on mental health, on like TikTok alone, 50% were just completely false information and another 25% was like a half truth, um, which is concerning, obviously. Um, is this a trend that you see? Why do you think pop psychology specifically has cleaved on to ADHD? Like why is it such a sexy topic compared to like depression well, or anxiety? I think one, one reason is that because it involves uh, kids. So anything that involves kids is, is emotionally charged and that's one of the reasons why it's been one of the more stigmatized disorders over time. It's been more, it's, it's one that's been attacked by the anti-psychiatry movements over time. So it's had this, um, it's been in popular culture. It's always been in popular culture, right? I mean, you go to Amazon, you can find books on Amazon that are called things like the ADHD fraud, right. just as one name, because there are still people trying to make money off of this. And essentially what you've, you, you get with a lot of these, uh, TikTok influencers is that they found a niche that's a great way to make money, essentially. You know, you can, they can do this stuff. They can say all these ridiculous things and people like it because they're entertaining, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they'll spend hours, you know, of these I mean, multiple TikToks. It takes hours to watch multiple and they'll just spend so much time watching this BS and they'll spend very little time listening to somebody like me because I'm not entertaining. You know, I, I look at the image, just the boring old guy who's got like these complicated things to make you think which kind of hurts your brain a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's it's really sad, but it's kind of the world, it's the world we live in where em emotional appeals that are, you know, laced with entertainment are much more attractive than actual, just good information. It's sad, but this is, it's a, it, the world's getting that way. And I'll tell you, the TikTokers, 
they make money. I once asked a TikToker, says, you know, we're trying to disseminate, you know, information, good information about ADHD at ADHDevidence.org. Maybe you could help, uh, you know, help us by getting people to go there. And he said, sure. He says, uh, I'll mention it in the TikTok. It'll cost you $30,000. Wow. That's all. 30K <laughs> for one? Yes. For just one, one, one little tiny TikTok. Oh my goodness. And, you know, I think it's maybe 15K for the tick and 15 for the talk, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> well, if your if your secret conspiracy with the pharmaceutical companies don't work out, you could just become a TikToker. <laughs> well, there you go. Actually, that's what I that's what I should have done. <laughs> yeah. What do you think causes right? Because I I'm really actually interested in that bridge between like kind of lay people, social media communication, and academia, because I think you're right. In many ways, academics are kind of boring to listen to because they say big words uh, and they say yeah. a bunch of acronyms that nobody knows too quickly because it's their like go-to yeah. thing. Yeah. How yeah. do you think we bridge that better? Well, I've been trying to in my own life. You know, as I, I mean, I was terrible at the beginning. I'm getting better now. I'm still imperfect. Um, it's hard to bridge it completely because we're, for the most part, not entertainers. It's right. not completely true. I have a few colleagues who are, you know, they're pretty funny and they're entertaining, but most of us, we're just entertainers. If we were, we'd be in a different business. We'd be doing something different. Right. You know, we're people that think deeply and seriously about topics. Uh, and we spend a lot of time thinking about it. Um, one of the problems we have, and I have tried to, you know, adjust that, and hopefully it's it's, it's adjusted on this, uh, this, um, this interview you're doing here, is I try to avoid the big words if I can, uh, I try to avoid uh, what I would call hedging. Mm. And what hedging is, is, you know, in when you write a paper for an academic journal, you say, okay, here's what we did, here's what we found, here are our conclusions. And by the way, here are some reasons why we might be wrong. And that's because, you know, we take, we take kind of the search for the truth seriously. And we always want to be kind of hedging and, and explain to people where the problems are in what we might say. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's okay for the academic audience, but it's it's not okay when we're talking to the public because the public needs to know, well, what do you, Dr. Ferron, what do you really think about this? Yeah. You know, what's what's your judgment on that? And so when I talk to the public, I'm telling them, you know, what I think based upon the knowledge I've accru accrued, accrued over 30 years. And I'm not going to go into all the footnotes about why this might be a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, because that's really not what people want to hear. And right. it just it just muddies the message. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. I uh, obviously I do this, but I have I have been an academic. Uh, I'm young, obviously. I'm a little baby academic, but um, <laughs> baby academic that's a new term. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like one of my favorite things to do, like in my lab, is help like my lab mates prepare presentations uh, and talks uh, because I think like being able to communicate in a really interesting way, like figuring out what will capture people and then talking about it in an informative, mm -hmm. but also like like edutainment essentially, I think is like one of the most important things that we can be trained on. Actually in my undergrad, I was so mm -hmm. blessed because one of my undergrad, um, we had in our honors program, we obviously have like a tight little knit cohort. And one of the supervisors that kind of oversaw the honors mm -hmm. cohort was big into public presentations. So we had to do an entire class just on presenting information, interestingly. Um, every single class, we were just given a new topic. We wow. had a week to present. That's great. Prep. That's great. So it was amazing. And I look back at that. I mean, at the time it was awful. I hated it because it's just like yeah. presentation after presentation. But I look back and I'm like, every, we need to be teaching like academics and students this, like specifically this skill, because um, it's so I, important. I would argue that one of the big failings of the American education system is that we're not teaching kids as early as, you know, junior high school, how to talk to other people. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we teach them a lot of arcane things they'll never use in their life, but we teach them how to give presentations, how to talk to people. We don't, and that's rarely done even at the, you know, undergraduate and graduate levels. That's great what you're doing there. I think it's, I wish I had had experiences like that early in, in early in life, because it's, uh, it would make a difference in our ability to communicate with, with the world at yeah. large. Yeah. Because we, we, we are neurodivergent in ourselves, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Regarding common myths, it's so interesting because depending on, not that I want this politicized, but depending on the political sphere you go into, you come across very opposite myths now around mental health, hmm. I've noticed. I'm not sure if you've noticed this, right? In like no. a lot of these more conservative traditional spaces, there's still questions on things like, how do we differentiate laziness from like ADHD? 
um, which I think is like an important topic to talk about. Um, whereas on the on the left, we'll often see more myths like things like, I'd be curious to know your thoughts on things like hyperfocus, rejection sensitivity, dysphoria, kind of those types of things that are really popular on the, kind of the other side and and the laziness conversation. I'm just curious about myths in general. Yeah, well, I mean, these myths are very dangerous. I mean, laziness is, mental health has always been stigmatized by things like this, right? Yeah. I mean, depressed depressed people were called weak and not, you know, something's wrong. They're, they're weak and everybody else can deal with this. Why can't they deal with it? Uh, you know, people have ADHD been called lazy. It, it's just, it's a total, it's the stigma of people not understanding mental illness as a disorder, as opposed to some kind of weakness of personality. And that's, you know, that's, that's the simple, that's really the simple one. The, these newer ones, um, the hyperfocus rejection sensitive dysphoria. It's interesting you mentioned those two, because I got, uh, I've done a few ask me anything sessions on Reddit and those are popular topics to come up as questions. Yeah. Um, and they're what, trending. They're, they're trending. Exactly. They're trending. Um, well, there's actually, I have two there and they're two actually good examples because they're, I have two different types of responses for them. When it comes to rejection sensitive this rejection sensitive oof, I can't even say it, <laughs> rejection sensitive dysphoria. Um, another one is also gender dysphoria. I've had questions about is that really is that ADHD? Mm -hmm. um, those are probably more in the realm of uh, what we would call associated features that people with ADHD are maybe more likely to have these features. And I honestly don't know if they do because the I don't know I don't know of any research in those on those particular topics. Uh, it may be out there. I just might not have seen it. Um, but it's not. They're not. Um, they're not uh, behaviors or feelings that are themselves directly connected to what we think of as the core problems of uh, so, uh, difficulties in self-regulation, which is the ADHD. Mm -hmm. Hyper, Hyperfocus is different. Hyperfocus is just, um, it's it's a very descriptive term. It's kind of like uh, I, the classic example is that, you know, doctor says, I think your child has ADHD. And the mother says, no, he's he plays a video game. He is hyperfocused. He can be on that screen for hours and hours and hours like he's he's magnetized to it um so it's a good description of the behavior hyper focus but what's really happening there has to do with um another type of, of dysregulation adhd and that has to do with uh, uh dysregulation of sensitivity to reward mm. so okay everybody's listening they know about reward and punishment You're like we do things that we're rewarded for we don't do things that we're punished for and everybody um well, not everybody, but some of us know about the famous marshmallow test. Um, you know, if you uh, explain it to the audience, like it's a little famous experiment where a child's in a room and the, the experimenter gives them a plate with a marshmallow on it. And they say, um, you can eat this marshmallow now, but if you wait until I get back, I'll give you another one. You can have two. Right. And some kids eat the marshmallow right away. Um, many of those kids have ADHD because ADHD kids can't wait mm -hmm. to eat the marshmallow. Other kids just sit there politely and experiment comes back and they get the second marshmallow and there's all, all gradations in between um the the inability to uh, d delay getting the reward is uh part of what we call broadly dis reward dysregulation now in adhd what we've what we found is that actually we again the field i haven't done this research myself is that people with adhd are relatively insensitive insensitive to rewards that are in the distant future so if you tell a child, well, if you, you know, do your homework on a regular basis, I'll take you to the movies next month. That's worthless because that reward is so far away, it's not going to affect their behavior. Right. Uh, but rewards in video games are very immediate. They're very, they're very, they're, 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 well, I'm trying to avoid the big words. They're proximal, they're immediate, they happen right away and they're, they're strong. They're, they, they the child experience them as, a, as very rewarding. So any, any reward that is, happens in, very quickly after the behavior and is very strong will lead to hyper focus because that's what the, what's what glues somebody with ADHD to something is that they're experiencing something for them that's very rewarding mm. and but it, it's, in a way it's too rewarding because they can't they can't get away from it okay. um so there you go that's uh my view of that okay interesting um I remember reading I'd be super curious adult ADHD itself fascinates me uh, I'm sure you've probably read this have you read the Moffat at all longitudinal study out of New Zealand <laughs> yes I, okay. I have yes I have <laughs> uh, 
what do you, maybe I'll describe it for the audience so they have some context. So there was a longitudinal study, and I believe it was for 30 years, uh, with mm -hmm. the same cohort yeah. looking at ADHD symptoms over time. Unsurprisingly, in their cohort, 6% had ADHD as kids. That's pretty standard for the prevalence rates. Uh, however, the interesting finding was that after they turned 18 and they were testing again for ADHD, I think at like, I think at like 21 and maybe a little bit later, uh, they found that there was a large number of people diagnosed with ADHD adult ADHD and then about 90% of the people with adult ADHD expressed no childhood ADHD. So this was obviously proffered as like, maybe the idea that it's like this neurodevelopmental thing is wrong and our etiology, like our understanding of the, the, the cause of ADHD has been wrong this whole time. What are your thoughts on that paper? Well, um, I, I'll refer you to a um, editorial I wrote with my colleague, Joe Biederman and published in JAMA Psychiatry. Uh, not too sh long after that was published, where we, we we explain in detail why that article is wrong. Um, I think it was partly a failure of the review process that the paper never should have been published in that form. Um, the, the investigators, very competent people, they made great contributions, but uh, did some uh, misinterpreted, I would say, their data. Um, I can't, the details, it's, it's, it would take a long time to go into the details, but one simple way to... Uh, to one, one reason I knew it was wrong when I read it immediately was because they said all childhood ADHD disappears in adulthood and all adult ADHD is adult onset ADHD. Right. Well, well, by the way, we know from at least, what, 15 or more studies of kids that are literally followed up into adulthood that that wasn't true. We just know that because, you know, that's, we've seen that we, in our own work, other people had seen that. So yeah. this one study could not erase that. Um, so uh, the study was essentially uh, wrong for lots of reasons. What they, there's a misunderstanding uh, about what it means for an adult who comes in for the first time to a doctor's office or a nurse practitioner's office and seems to have ADHD, but never had, was diagnosed in childhood and has difficulty, difficulty remembering something that happened in childhood. Now we call those a parent I call those apparent adult onset ADHD because it seems like the onset's in adulthood. Mm. Um, and those people are real. They, that's, that's a very common sight in the, in the clinic, the apparent adult onset. Uh, people that have studied that group really in detail. And the, the New Zealand study was a big epidemiologic study. So they didn't have really as, as detailed assessments as, uh, for example, Maggie Sibley published a, a paper from the... Um, I think she was, yes, yeah, she was first author on that from the MTA study, which is a big study in the US, of a more of a clinical study. And they basically showed if you did in-depth clinical assessments, you could account for all the so-called adult onset ADHD mm -hmm. um, very easily um, with, in, with detailed clinical assessments. Um, so the, the message is really, ADHD does not, well, let's put it this way, nothing's, you never say never, right? So the, we know that ADHD does, can happen de novo, for example, with uh, mild traumatic brain injury. If you have somebody who had no signs of ADHD, they have a mild traumatic brain injury and they have ADHD. Um, but for, for most forms of ADHD, people who have it as adults had something going on with them as, as kids. It's just, you have to dig deep enough to find it. So for example, in the, in the New Zealand study, um, if you well, the thing about the New Zealand study, I think it was, if you look at the people that they said had adult onset ADHD, 30% mm -hmm. of them had a diagnosis of conduct disorder in childhood. Mm, interesting. Now, yeah, yeah, because as you know, right, I mean, kids with conduct disorder have pretty high rates of ADHD. So why is it that they had conduct disorder, but not ADHD? Right. Uh, they, they weren't neurotypical, essentially. So yeah. it, it's... There you go. So it was a, yeah, that's something that was a big, a big, I, I thought, I, I thought it created a big problem for the field because it gave the wrong information. When you give bad information to doctors, such as I should expect a lot of de novo onsets of ADHD, that's, that's dangerous for everybody. Right. And for, for viewers who are kind of uncertain what that means with conduct disorder, conduct disorder is kind of like a precursor to sometimes later becomes antisocial personality disorder. And it's associated with a number mm -hmm. of markers of basically high levels of impulsivity and kind of like doing things that we typically don't want to see, like being very naughty, essentially. Um, and so the, the, the interesting part is that impulsivity piece. They clearly had impulse issues if they were diagnosed with CD, most likely. Um, okay, interesting. That's good to hear. I wasn't, that one, I remember reading that article and being like, okay, this is kind of like breaking my brain a little bit because this doesn't map onto like 
anything I understand about like neuroscience or neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, but it, it actually got it got a little worse because what happened was it was it was replicated. Uh, I'll say in scare quotes by three other studies. That's when we ended up writing the editorial because JAMA Psychiatry asked for an editorial, and those three studies basically made they all made the same mistake. So you know if you if you replicate a mistake, you're going to get the same wrong wrong results. So it it, it did cause a big stir in the field for quite a long time. But let's get let's move on. I'm, you're, I, I don't want to bore your people with <laughs> my personal issues about that paper. I'm going to be honest, people love personal issues of academics. They very, <laughs> they very rarely get to see it. So it, it gets them very excited. Um, I'm just looking through some of the questions from the community that we haven't covered. Uh, exercise. A couple of people were wondering specifically about exercise and ADHD. So obviously you said supplements, kind of all these other treatments. Does exercise improve ADHD symptomology at all? Exercise is great for everybody. Everybody should exercise. Everybody should stay healthy, eat healthy foods. It's one of the best things you can do in your life for everything that's that, that you're involved with. Is it a specific treatment for ADHD? No. Will it make you feel better if you have ADHD? Yes. Will it help you sleep better? It may help you sleep better. Uh, helps me sleep better. Helps me feel better. Mm -hmm. It will not dramatically help symptoms of ADHD. That's This has been pretty well uh, documented in, in lots of studies. Okay. I'd be curious about circadian rhythms with ADHD. I know there's a lot of literature on circadian rhythms and talking about how like it might even be delayed, which is why ADHD people might have a hard time falling asleep at like regular times and whatnot. Does this map on to empirical evidence? What do we know about circadian rhythms? And and for people who yeah. don't know, could you describe what a circadian rhythm is yeah. and then also how it impacts ADHD? Yeah, so well, circadian rhythm is a, any biological rhythm that fluctuates throughout the day in a systematic way. Right. Um, so um, one way to think about differences, individual differences in circadian rhythms is that most of us know that there are some people who just like this or always want to stay up late and sleep, sleep late in the morning. And there are other people like me who get up at 5 a.m. And, and want to go to sleep early at night uh, because we, we have different rhythms, the, the morning lark and the night owl, very different rhythms. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there is some good data that, first of all, we know that uh, ADHD, uh, even untreated ADHD is associated with all sorts of sleep difficulties, independent of the medicines, which sometimes can cause insomnia. Um, ADHD itself is is causes sleep uh, sl uh, sleep difficulties and sleep difficulties, like for example, sleep apnea. Uh, sleep apnea can sometimes mimic ADHD, and if it's taken care of, can uh, sometimes the ADHD will go will actually go away. Mm -hmm. Um, there have been other studies, um, you know, when, when you try to get at the biology of the circadian rhythms, those studies have been a little bit more difficult, um, but there have been some studies looking at, they're actually circadian rhythm genes that people have studied, and there's some evidence that some of those genes may be uh, dysregulated in the ADHD, but that's all really very kind of preliminary stuff. Um, but it, it's one of these areas that is, you know, uh, a potent area for, for research to try to better understand um, how it might help people, particularly, particularly as regards their sleep conditions. Yeah, it was interesting. My friend, she studies, she does work in like early developmental stuff. She sent me a paper that was talking about how there's a bunch of kids that had, they, it was mapping on the correlation of like, there's three disorders. It was sleep apnea, asthma, and another problem, like another breathing problem. I can't mm. remember what it was in children. Uh, and the, the rate at which these kids are also diagnosed with ADHD was like, astronomical, like really, really, really high, kind of something yeah. like you would expect with like IBS and anxiety, where it's like, these two mm -hmm. things are linked, they must be. Um, and it was really interesting to see that as like the asthma and sleep apnea got correctly treated, the ADHD symptoms decreased, uh, which creates this, this question of like, so did these kids ever have ADHD? If ADHD is neurodevelopmental, we're saying their brains are different, but the sleep apnea itself corrected it. Does that mean that their brains healed or does that mean that their brains were never different? It just looked like ADHD. I, it, it's, you're asking great questions. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think in, in those cases, it's a situation where the brain was affected by, for example, lack of oxygen, lack of sleep. Yeah. And they, it's, it, they had a different condition than somebody whose brain perhaps at birth was not wired correctly. Mm -hmm. And, developed ADHD because of a miswiring of the brain, so to speak. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah. I think they're different. They'd probably come down to different. If we could look at that ultimate cause, they'd be very different. Right. One thing I've also noticed, how often does, do you see things like, so anxiety and ADHD are really interesting to me because of how similar they can look uh, in people. How do you differentiate the diagnosis for people? So like when people are going to their doctor with an identification of some symptoms that they have, 
how do they know whether they're leaning towards like an ADHD diagnosis or an anxiety diagnosis? Because obviously if it's anxiety, you wouldn't want to treat it necessarily like ADHD because the stimulants would probably not be the best combo for their anxiety. Well, that's actually, it's actually, a, 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 it's actually a myth about that because there's actually a literature that shows, now you're, you're actually correct that, you know, stimulus can cause anxiety because they can make people feel jittery. That's very true. But in clinical trials, when they've looked at it, there's actually, there's actually shows that, that, that people with ADHD when appropriately treated show reductions in their anxiety symptoms over time. Mm. Um, that's because there's, in addition to the potential that some people have this little adverse effect, which will go away, that many people, because they get control of their life and the, through control of their ADHD symptoms, they, bec they become less anxious in general. But that said, um, I lost my train of thought here. You were asking about differentiate differentiation. Yeah, yeah. situations where they yeah. think it's ADHD, but let's say we were one, God tells us it's actually been anxiety this whole time. How do we differentiate those two things? So, well, one way we do is that uh, many anxiety disorders are, are pretty episodic, whereas ADHD tends to be chronic. Although there's some interesting discussion about that recently. But for the most part, ADHD is 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 around in all situ in all situations and fairly persistently, although the, it, the levels of it kind of fluctuate. Now, there's generalized anxiety disorder and some anxiety conditions that are are also persistent. In that case, you really kind of go you go back to the the symptoms of the of the disorder, right? Mm -hmm. If and the, see the way I was trained was that instead of trying to differentiate disorders, we're better off documenting which disorders are present and then to figure out which disorders are causing the most trouble. So the, the rule of thumb, like when I lecture on this topic, I'll tell clinicians, I'll say, rule of thumb is you document all the disorders that are present. And instead of worrying, is it ADHD, this anxiety? Because sometimes it's, it may be hard to pull those two apart. Yeah. Um, you you tr then figure out well, which, which symptoms are causing the most trouble. And you treat those first. Let's say you decide it's ADHD, you treat those first and it, the anxiety goes away, well, you're home free. You don't have to worry about it. Right. In some cases, you treat the ADHD and nothing changes. You might realize, well, that, you know, maybe I made a mistake here. Now, we have to keep in mind that the, the symptoms that diagnose ADHD and the symptoms that diagnose anxiety are very different so that you can, you can make those two diagnoses. And if you happen to make two diagnoses in the same person, it probably means they have two disorders for the most part. Mm -hmm which some people say, well, that's crazy. I thought that all these disorders were different. And the answer is, well, no, they're, they're, they are different, but we know from lots of research that if you have one mental health problem, you are at increased risk for having another one. Right. And we know from the new genomics, and this is data only coming out recently, that not only does this overlap occur, it's observed in clinics. It's not simply that, okay, I have ADHD, it makes me miserable, I get depressed. We know from genetic studies that there's actually a, when talking now about molecular genetic studies, where we actually have people's DNA, that there's a correlation at the level of DNA between the risks for ADHD and the risks for depression, the risks for anxiety, the risk for almost every other psychiatric condition. So there's this, I kind of think that there's kind of this neurodevelopmental substrate that all disorders share, um, that then the pathway one takes depends upon the other risk factors that we're exposed to. Yeah, it's kind of one of these interesting tensions with like where we're at in neuroscience, which is like anyone who gets more into neuroscience realizes that we know no idea anything about neuroscience. <laughs> yes. um, we know lots and we know literally nothing. Uh, and the and the issue with categorization, right? The DSM is great in that it like gives us labels and all of these things, but there's kind of this myth of categorization, which is that like anxiety mm -hmm. is obviously and self-evidently wholly discrete from like depression or a personality disorder. Um, and yet these things like deeply overlap uh, and are really hard to disentangle. Well, absolutely. When, when I was trained, okay, and when I was, this is back in the early eighties, you were not allowed to, let's see, you were not allowed by the DSM, diagnostic manual. You could not, you were not allowed to diagnose anxiety if the patient had a major depression, major depression, mm -hmm. because the two things couldn't go together. It was, it was something somehow categorically different. Um, and then sometime in the 1990s, that got changed when they realized that was ridiculous. When I was trained, you couldn't diagnose somebody with autism as having ADHD, mm -hmm. wouldn't be allowed. Right. Now we can do that in the most recent iteration. And those were very huge mistakes because it meant people weren't getting appropriate treatment because 
disorders that they had were just not being treated because the physicians were thought they didn't really have them, which is really kind of bizarre when you think about it, but that's, that's how people thought back then. Yeah. Um, I'll maybe go, I have one more of my questions and then I'll go to some of the community questions because I know we're about to wrap up on time. Um, I find when I'm thinking about things like my childhood was messed up and now I'm kind of messed up syndrome, right? Whatever we're going to call that eventually in the future. Okay. Um, and then we're talking about things like neurodevelopmental disorders and developmental disorders. I feel like these things obviously overlay, right? There's Gabor Mate, for example, who really pushes this idea that almost all ADHD is trauma. I don't really agree with him necessarily, um, but I think that there's something there. What do you think about kind of like this complex okay. early childhood let's, stuff? Let's stop. Yeah, let's stop at one second. So anyone that says that all ADHD is trauma is totally, it's an absurd statement. It's totally wrong. They they have not been reading any scientific literature for the past 30 years. Okay, that's somebody, maybe they're selling their own trauma therapy because they can make more money because people come to them because they're the guru of trauma. That's absurd. Now, having said that, people who are traumatized, they need to have an appropriate ther therapy to deal with their trauma. There's no question about that. I'm not saying that that shouldn't happen, but we know, well, I mean, you can just, People with ADHD are people first before they are people with ADHD. And all people can be, can be subjected to traumatic experiences. It doesn't mean just because you have ADHD and you had trauma that your trauma was due to your ADHD, except in rare cases. So we do know, for example, that kids who were raised in Romanian orph orphanages, who were given very little food, who had very little contact with humans, um, that when they were older, they had all sorts of neurodevelopmental problems, including ADHD. Mm -hmm. That's a clear traumatic ADHD that in fact resolved. When some, when some of these kids were adopted into families in the UK and they were given enriched environments, their ADHD went away, their intelligence scores increased. Um, but those are the rare cases. The other kids that are traumatized have another problem. And let's be, be careful we talk about this because sometimes people say it's blaming the victim, but it's not. Um, the we know for example from lots of studies that there's a genetic risk for adhd mm -hmm. no one would argue with that that's been touching the scientific literature we can now define that genomic risk to some degree based upon dna now if i go into a population out anywhere and i measure their adhd risk in their dna in their dna what i will find or what other people have found already i should say <laughs> is that the genomic risk for ADHD will predict, and we're not talking now about children with ADHD, we're just about children in general. The, their genomic risk for ADHD will predict whether they've had a history of, of physical abuse, history of sexual abuse, of being bullied, and other adverse traumatic experiences. Mm. Now, how can that be? Well, it, it could be because genes in an environment are not independent of one another. Genes put us into environments. And if you happen to have genes for ADHD, well, your parents have them. And then if your parent has to be an impulsive antisocial father, you may be then subject to, to being abused by your father. Uh, other kinds of trauma, you know, the trauma of being in a traffic accident. Well, if you're some kid with ADHD, you're more likely to be exposed to that kind of trauma because you're impulsive and you put yourself in situations where you have more trauma. So kids with ADHD sometimes have this, it's really a, a double hit. They've got the, the genetic load mm -hmm. and then they've got the the correlated traumatic environment, but to say that the trauma independently caused their ADHD is just totally wrong. Yeah. So, and, and to say that somehow the treatment's different is also totally wrong and denies denies kids appropriate treatment. And that's why you can hear me, I'm not happy about this, right? Because, I'm, and I'm not happy because it means there are some people who are not, who denied appropriate treatment for years and that's just awful. Um, I'll maybe get to some of the community live chats. So I'll just let the community know if you guys would like to send in a question, typically through super chats or like bits is going to be the best way for me to see it. Uh, you can also attach it to like a subscription. That'll be the way to highlight your message. Um, the first question that came in kind of early on, uh, is about caffeine. Uh, they were wondering about caffeine and kids and ADHD. Does it help kids with ADHD? If it does, why? It has not been shown to be an effective treatment for ADHD. I mean, like anyone else that drinks caffeine, it'll make you a little bit more alert, but that's basically all it will do. Okay. 
not, okay. not a recommended approach. Okay. Yeah. What does the literature say about how we understand time? Uh, often I explain my condition, uh, I'm assuming this person has ADHD, as someone, as imagine that sometimes things are boring and it feels like two weeks or vice versa, but I don't pick which one. Yeah, you've, your insight is uh, totally correct. Um, neuropsychological studies clearly show that people with ADHD process time differently um, than people without ADHD, that their sense of time is just not quite there. Um, simple experiment, experiment takes you into a room, sits you down, says, I'll be back a little bit, just stay here. Comes back, says, how long was I gone? Person without ADHD is pretty good at telling the experimenter that they were gone for seven minutes, plus or minus a few minutes. People with ADHD will be all over the place with the amount of time because they, their, their, their brains are not wired in a way that's good at processing time. That's so, that's super interesting. That explains, so my husband has ADHD as well, and he's the worst at gauging how long it'll take to get home. Like no matter where we are, I'll be like, we'll be home in like 15. And I'm like, it's going to be like 40 <laughs> minutes before we're home. Like, that's not true. So anytime he gives me a, a like time segment of when I'll be home, I'm like, that's probably incorrect. Who knows what, because it's either over or under, but it's never correct. Um, that's right. So that, that helps me understand. Um, how do I choose vet and start to trust a psychologist? I'm overly logical and very good at analyzing things. And I really struggle with trusting professionals. Well, number one, use your gut. I mean, all of the literature shows that if you're, uh, if we're talking, for example, psychotherapy or some kind of therapy with a psychological therapy with a psychologist, the best predictor of whether you'll do well is whether you, whether you have a connection with that person. Uh, when I say connection, I just mean that you, you like them, that there's a, there's a, a good uh, emotional connection with that person. Not just, not just that you're impressed with their CV or something along those lines. That would be the most important thing. If they start to say things that just sound like they're wrong, then you know, they're probably, they, they may just not be good psychologists. They, if they start to say things that trauma causes ADHD or yeah. things that are, are different from what you've heard, you know, maybe if you believe that what I say and someone's saying things that are very different from that, you know, look, I, there are some very bad healthcare people out there and you need to, you, you do need to choose carefully and don't be afraid to, you know, fire your psychologist and get another one until you find someone that is, um, seems to know what they're talking about. Check up on things that they say if it sounds a little sketchy. Go to PubMed. PubMed.gov is a great place to look up scientific literature where you can get a sense of what's out there. I'd be curious, I'd be curious how you feel about this one. I often will tell my community uh, when it comes to professionals like counseling psychologists and stuff, I'm very comfortable saying that they are experts in people. They're often very good at working with and building rapport, but that doesn't actually make them experts of psychological science, um, which I know is a bit of a spicy take, so you don't have to jump on board with that. But I'm very, very like, I don't care if yeah. they're a PhD in counseling psychology. It doesn't mean that they're correct about like psychological science. Absolutely true. That's well, very well said. Very well said. Uh, next question. My community loves book recommendations. Do you have any solid book recommendations about ADHD that is not Gabor Mate's book? I would say, um, without giving titles that I don't recall the, the names of, anything that's written by, well, the two Russells, Russell Barkley, B-A-R-K-L-E-Y, uh, or Russell Ramsey, R-A-M-S-E-Y. Those guys are, they're, they're um, two guys that are excellent ADHD scientists. The first one, Barkley, now retired, but his books are still around. And also have are have written books both for the public and also for people like me that are just quite good. So I recommend their stuff. Mm, okay. Um, I guess I don't see any more questions coming in, so I'll ask my last question. I will also give a shout out for ADHDevidence.org. That's my website where I curate uh, evidence about ADHD for hopefully that's understandable by the lay public. So. Okay. Um, take a look there and visit the international consensus statement if you really want to know the facts about the disorder. If yeah. your psychologist argues with any of those, then you fire them and find someone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I actually love your website. I um, I refer to it a lot, actually. I really Thank like you. your Reddit AMAs, especially. I think that's like, I just, whenever I see people like yourself or Jonathan Haidt or just researchers that are willing to like go out and like talk to people and answer lots of questions, I just, I just think it's a really good thing. Um, so I will absolutely link it. Uh, in, awesome. in the description Thank you. as well. Thank yeah. you. Um, I guess kind of like last question, you probably have a pretty good feel out for like the types of researchers and researchers that are upcoming in the field. Obviously, when I'm in doubt about 
questions about ADHD, I just look you up. And I got a, a couple of other camps of researchers on different topics as well. Is there anyone that's kind of underneath you or that you've heard of that's kind of in the field of ADHD or just in clinical psychology in general that you think does really good research, is constantly producing high, high quality that you should kind of maybe get your eye on and, and start reading yeah. some of their stuff? Um, I like the work that Maggie Sibley has been producing. She's now at it in Seattle. Um, and she's just a clinical psychologist, does a lot of work in the treatment space, but also has done some of the work uh, clarifying adult ADHD diagnoses and so forth. Her work is, um, I, I think, top rate. You, I think you refer to younger people when, in your question. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, she would definitely fit that bill. As, okay. uh, and do you know how to spell her, Katie, is it Katie IE? And then last name, I'm not sure how to spell it. Her first name is Maggie. Maggie, Margaret. sorry. Maybe. Margaret and last name Sibley S I B L E Y. Sibley L E Y. S I B L E. That's, that's the one you mentioned that did the the large. Um, was it a longitudinal study as well? That English? was she was she analyzed data from that big study, but okay. she, it wasn't her study per se. But yeah, she also did that work. Yes, okay. yeah, she's she's really good. Margaret Sibley, awesome. Uh, do you still run like a, a research lab in university and everything like that? I do. Yeah, I do. Um, have at this point, I have a one. Assistant professor, well, not assistant professor. She's an associate professor and a postdoc and a graduate student that we uh, do work. Mostly now, I've, my work has moved into uh, my experimental work has moved towards what I call predictive modeling, trying to predict um, who is at high risk for what outcomes, mm. um, and can we can we take those predictions and use them in a clinically useful way. That's that's really cool research. Yeah, I know U of Calgary, uh, I'm at least aware of, is doing some really interesting research on predicting depression expression in children. Um, that's been really, really cool. Yeah, it's a new frontier. It's, uh, it's, it's motivating. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, okay, we've got one last question that came in, and then I'll let you go. Uh, how do you, how prevalent is comorbid ADHD and OCD? Uh, I read a study where OCD early in life can cause dopamine deficiencies and therefore present ADHD symptoms. Thoughts on that? Yeah, so I wouldn't I, I wouldn't say that OCD causes dopamine deficiencies and that causes ADHD. And it's possible, and, and someone's doing research in the air. It'd be great to see if that holds true. Um, but we do know that there is a there those two disorders occur together more than one would expect by chance alone, for mm -hmm. sure. So I would I mean I don't have the number at the top of my head, but I would guess that maybe up to ten or 20, 10, 50, 10 percent of it, kids with ADHD might have OCD. Um, so it's it is a real comorbidity. Interesting. That's a really, really interesting comorbidity. Um, okay. Do you have time for one last question or are you spoon? I, 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 I'm enjoying this. So you just, <laughs> okay. I mean, if you want to, if you want to keep going, I, we keep getting questions sent in and I will, I will yeah, I'll answer questions. questions I, I, I do like to, I do like to, um, well, let's put it this way. I discovered in my career that I can publish lots of papers that my colleagues read, and that's one way to have impact. And I, I do feel that I know some of the things have changed clinical practice because people have told me that, but the biggest impact one can have is to, is to educate the public. And so I, that's why I do stuff like this now, because it's important. It's yeah. really important. Yeah, it is. So let's, let's go on. Okay. Uh, in the future, will there be AD, will ADHD be a more umbrella term? And then will treatment and diagnosis be more granular to the executive function symptoms? Do you kind of expect any of that? Let me know if you need mm. me to reread it. There's a typo in there. So. I kind of get what you're saying. I, I think, well, if I were in charge, I would um, make the di the diagnostic manual understand that what we're talking about our dimensions of uh, order and disorder in the human mind that we should kind of think as traits, continuous traits. And we should really just be trying to measure people to the degree to which they have these traits and that they cause impairments. And in one of the, for example, the executive dysfunction is a really good example. Sometimes I ask myself, how come that was never considered to be a separate disorder in its own right? Right. Mm -hmm. we, we we think of it as something that's you know wrong in people with ADHD, but you know, people with schizophrenia have executive dysfunction, people with depression have executive dysfunction. Um, if I had another career, I think I would actually look at this whole question as to whether it makes, makes actually sense to think of executive dysfunction as a separate disorder. I think it's not considered a separate disorder, mostly just because of a kind of a trade union issue. It's something that, you know, psychologists sort of have discovered and did a lot of work in, and it's not part of psychiatry per se. So it never kind of had that 
veneer as a, as a, as a disorder. But I, I think the best way for the manuals to do that would be to just document these different types of problems um, in, a, uh, in a way that psychologists really do by measuring it in a, as, as continuous traits. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I was just thinking on the stuff you brought up about OCD and ADHD. Um, I actually wasn't aware that OCD and ADHD kind of co-occur together in an unexpectedly kind of possibly biologically linked way, which is fascinating to me because I think about OCD, when I think about OCD, I think about eating disorders, specifically like anorexia, which is a very mm -hmm. like rigid kind of overly mm -hmm. self-restrained disorder. So it's interesting to hear OCD mapping onto both of these things. When, when I think of AOCD, I think of rigidity, but I guess there there's an element also of impulsivity because I know OCD has also been somewhat connected to Tourette's as well. Yes, there you go. And it, 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 I think what it comes down to is that my kind of, and this is just really theory as opposed to fact, that there's the, there's early, there's an early impact to the brain that affects anybody that has a, a neurodevelopmental disorder. And this miswiring of the brain can take take the brain in different in different directions but because there's you know let's think let's just be very concrete about it right let's say child's born and you know they have genes for put them at risk of some disorders maybe there there were some pregnancy and delivery complications so the oxygen to the brain was shut down for a brief period of time that's going to affect the brain maybe the mother was drinking too much alcohol that affected the brain all these things they're not just affecting it you know the dopamine system right or the norepinephrine system, that, they're not just affecting one system in the brain, they're affecting the entire brain. And so that's why we see this overlap in disorders because at, at the level of etiology, these, these etiological events have to affect more than one very well-defined brain system. Okay. Um, oh, at the moment you said, I just want to keep answering questions. We just got flooded with them. So uh, <laughs> uh, all of chat said you're very based, which in young person speak is a good thing. Um, okay, good. <laughs> I was worried. <laughs> no, it's a compliment. It's a compliment. Uh, it means you're cool. It's the new way of saying you're cool. <laughs> <laughs> you passed the test. You've been approved. Um, does ADHD cause social anxiety? Well, okay, I, yeah, I'm going to sort of go try to dodge the cause question, but can people with ADHD be socially anxious? Absolutely. Because they, they especially if they haven't been, haven't had treatment, They've lived through, through as many years of their life where they've had, you know, there's been social failures. Their life hasn't worked out the way they wanted it to at, as socially. And so when they get to the next situation, you know, like it's like, the, it's like the animal that's been shocked every time they enter the cage, they're, you know, they get nervous every time they enter that cage. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a study done by Bill Pelham years ago. Uh, he, he liked to study kids at summer, in a summer camp setting. It was a kind of a well-defined area if he could study them. Yeah. And he once, uh, he was giving a lecture, he said, he says, how, do you, how long do you think it takes the kids in a summer camp to figure out which kids have ADHD? And he didn't mean diagnose them, but that they were different. Right. How long would that take to do? I said, I could feel like I had no idea. He says, he says by, by the end of lunch on the first day. Wow. He says, they can classify kids into groups. And essentially what he's saying is that kids with psychopathology or like ADHD, kids could tell. And because of that, kids can tell. Kids can be, you know, pretty nasty to kids that don't quite fit in. Right. And that leads to social anxiety. Yeah. So it's, again, it's kind of that epi phenomenon. It's that secondary emergent thing, possibly even like rejection sensitivity, where it's like you're emotionally yes. dysregulated, you are treated as kind of an other, and therefore you might be highly sensitive to being rejected because you're probably rejected more often than Exactly. Before. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, you asked, uh, about, so I asked you about circadian rhythms previously, but what about daily routines? This person's wondering, like, do ADHD people do better with like really strict, regular daily routines or is, does their disorder make that kind of more difficult for them to do? Well, it, it is good. Daily routines can be, can be very helpful, especially if you have something to help you get into that daily routine, like a, a planner on your cell phone or whatever on your computer, whatever works for the, uh, for, for a person, because it 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 keeps you moving along the path that you want to move along. Mm -hmm. Remember, that's what we we've been talking about executive dysfunctions, and one of the things our executive dysfunctions do is they, they help keep us organized in time and space. Right. And a lot of us just do that naturally, but if you need extra help doing that, having that schedule can help exactly help you do that. 
Um, I just realized we did the silly academic thing. We keep saying executive function, but I don't actually know if people know what that is. Could you just describe for people what executive function actually means? Okay, so the I guess the best way, to, well, how do we think about it? I, I like to think about executive fun functions as the, well, first of all, let's make, make it even go back a little bit. Say, so the, the brain, we, we, we have a brain and different parts of the brains have different functions that we do. We, like we see, we can see through the visual system. That's a, that's a function of the brain. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what we're talking about him as, as functions. Um, we have a lot of functions that involve sensation. The executive function at the highest levels of the brain, in fact, the humans are, are differentiated from most of the other species because of our executive functions, because they help organize all this information that we're, we, uh, we're pulling in all the time. They organize, organize us in time and space. They help us abstract. They help us sequence things in time and space. Um, any, any complex level of thinking is really executive function. Complex memory, mem complex memory, is also regulated by executive functions. So think of it as, as, as those functions that just keep you, I like to think of it as the functions that keep us organized in time and space, keep us moving. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's super helpful. Um, oh man, they're coming in now. I'm trying to keep up with all of them. So somebody missed this a little bit earlier. Could you super quickly outline again, very quickly, just differences between childhood and like the likelihood that childhood ADHD can present as symptoms for adult ADHD and the way to distinguish the one from the other. I think you said like well, two thirds of children with ADHD. So, yeah, so roughly, yeah. So roughly by young adulthood, that when kids grow up, that by when they get to young adult, adulthood, about two thirds of them will continue to have ADHD. That's been, we're pretty clear about that. Mm -hmm. And the, the symptoms change because as they get older, they tend to get uh, less hyperactive and a little bit less impulsive, more inattentive. And some of these ex this, these high levels, higher levels of disorganization due to executive dysfunction become more apparent too. Mm. And I think we also see more signs of emotional dysregulation as well. Okay. Interesting. Um, is there a link to memory loss and ADHD? Well, if we're talking about memory loss as in uh, minor, minor cognitive impairment and dementia in old age. Uh, it, it turns out that there is. In fact, we just when I say we now uh, with a group, I work with a group of colleagues um, in Sweden, and we look through their big six million people database they have in Sweden on all sorts of medical disorders. And what we found there is that indeed um, people with ADHD were at higher risk for um, uh, dementias later on in life. Uh, it, this is an area that's just beginning to be studied and because there's actually a, a deficiency of research in older adults with ADHD. Um, if you want, if you want someone to talk to you about that, get David Goodman. He's a kind of specialized in older adults with ADHD. It's really a, a, an area that's just we've lacked the uh, lacked research on. But yes, ADHD makes one's memory worse, and now we think that it, it puts people at risk for more serious memory problems later in life. Interesting. I had no idea about the connection with dementia because I, I know, like, I remember like growing up in like assessment, right? Where we say like, kids don't remember what they don't attend to, right? So a lot of the like memory loss issues that we sometimes mm -hmm. associate with ADHD people is more of a lack of attention to it. Um, yeah. But I didn't know about the dementia. Is there any connection to like, not proper like storage or retrieval in non-demented so like especially like younger uh, adhd persons it, it, it hasn't it has not been studied experimentally it's only a very little data that's just simple clinical clinical correlations meaning that we you know we just know from these big medical registry databases that those with adhd are at higher risk for dementia um you know we need to see this replicated in other studies and then do the kind of experimental studies you're talking about but it it kind of makes sense you know if you if you're Neural systems are a little bit weak because of um, these early problems that occur to the brain. I can see why that might cause more problems downstream, for sure. Mm. Thoughts on and, and again, not to have people with ADHD worry that, oh my God, I'm going to get demented. We're, we're talking about increased risks. That are, all these increased risks are, are real but small. So it's not that everybody with ADHD is going to get them. It's just that there's a connection that we've observed yeah. that we need to follow up on and understand better. Okay. Um, thoughts on comorbidity between ADHD and substance use disorders? 
Yeah, well, that's an important, that's a really important one. Uh, well, it used to be, well, one of the myths about ADHD for many years was that um, the medications for ADHD cause substance abuse. And that's because, well, I should say the stimulant medications, because they are controlled substances and one can become addicted to them if used improperly. Mm. Uh, it actually turns out there's now a lot of data that says actually just the opposite. When used therapeutically, um, the medications for ADHD, including the stimulant medications, reduce the risks for substance abuse uh, disorders. Um, and that's been very well documented now across uh, many studies. Um, so, the, it, but uh, the, and the, the part I'm leaving out is that in addition to all that, uh, there is the, the people with ADHD untreated aren't are at a higher risk for substance use disorders, even without, even especially without treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to do with, I mean, lots of reasons. There's lots of, there's lots of, there are many paths of substance abuse. One of them is reward dysregulation. We talked about that. If your reward system is not sensitive enough, well, you seek rewards, you know, elsewhere. That's mm -hmm. a big one. If you're anxious and depressed, you might, you're going to, you're going to drink and smoke and, and do all sorts of things uh, like that. And then I'd be remiss not to mention that the other substance problem with ADHD, although not the direct question here, has to do with the diversion and misuse and abuse of medications for ADHD for the wrong purposes. So, you know, there is a little bit of an epidemic on college campuses and among young adults in, you know, getting these stimulant medications for to study late at night or to st just to stay up late at night to party and sometimes for, for just out and out drug abuse. It's rare. That's that that last part is relatively rare, mm -hmm. um, but it, it is a concern. And and I would tell the young people who either you know have, have done this themselves or know people that whenever someone with ADHD diverts their medication, um, one of the mistakes that's made is they think that the, the person that is using diverted medication sometimes thinks, well, this medication has to be safe because a doctor prescribed it. Right. And and it's true that it's safe when it's used as prescribed, but the doctor prescribes it, who's prescribing it, for example, knows they don't prescribe it to people with certain kinds of cardiac problems because it could kill them. Um, right. They don't prescribe it to people with other things as well. So be careful about that if you're, uh, I mean, I shouldn't say be careful, just don't do it. You know, it's just not, uh, it's not a good thing. Right, right. So I, I, I'm, I'm not so based after all. <laughs> 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 yeah, you're not encouraging them to uh, take their meds in uh, non-doctor recommended methods. Yeah, don't exactly. parachute your guys' meds. Okay, don't do it. <laughs> um, hey, but is, I'm impressed how quickly you, you took on the word based. Um, that's, that's very based. <laughs> is it true that ADHD brains develop later in life or about 30% slower? Um, apparently somebody named Russell Barkley said so, so, uh, basically like a 17 year, 18 year old brain would be like 30% behind their peers of a similar age. Yeah. Well, Russell Barkley, I recommend, he's the one I recommended the books of. Um, so we, yes, the ADHD brain is, is delayed in development. And it used to be thought that, um, uh, everybody would catch up eventually and ADHD would disappear in adulthood. We now know that's not true, that, um, those delays don't always catch up. But some great work that Philip Shaw has done and other people, Philip's at the NIH, um, he's got some longitudinal studies which, where he takes brain scans over a period of time. And what he finds is that um, the brain differences you see in kids with, with that ADHD, they tend to get smaller as the kids get older. Mm -hmm. And the kids that show um, who have more neurotypical brains later in life are also the kids whose ADHD tends to remit. So... There is some evidence that if the brain catches up, the ADHD goes away. Interesting. Okay. Very interesting. So they are developing a little bit more slowly. Ex yes. Interesting. That's, that, and that doesn't, it begs the question of whether they're also developing in a way that's not neurotypical. Or right. In other words, are some, are some connections in the brain not being made or wrong connections being made? We just really don't know at this point um, at that level. Yeah, that's interesting. It makes me think about if, if you've got, like, I think practically now, if you've got a kiddo who's five, six, and there's kind of a strong probabilistic diagnosis of ADHD, would it be worth holding that kid back just a little bit so that they're in kind of a cohort that's cognitively more on par with them and give them a little bit more time or any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think obviously each individual case has to be looked at separately, but right. that's a, not a bad idea. I mean, because if, if it's like any other kind of immaturity you'd see in a child, right. um, the, why put them with more mature, more mature age mates um, when you don't have to, and you can hold them back? In fact, we do know from, there's actually another interesting literature that says, if you look at a given classroom, the kids who are more mature, they typically young for age, young for their grade, I should say, they're more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD than the kids who are older for the grade who are more mature. And it kind of makes sense, right? Because they're the kids who are less well-regulated. They're the kids who are having a harder time kind of processing everything, both socially and academically under right. more stresses. So yeah, no, that's a, it's a very good idea. Interesting. Okay. Um, is there any re research or resources for siblings of people with ADHD? As a parent raising a child with uh, autism and ADHD, I feel like my other child has needs connected to the family dynamic brought on by the uh, the sibling having the ADHD and yeah, autism. That's, yeah, that's that's a good question. I don't have an exact answer to that, but what I would say is is go to uh, the Chad website. That's C H A W D dot o r g chad is i think it stands for children and adults with attention deficit disorder that's uh, the family advocacy group the big family advocacy i'm sorry adv advocacy group for adhd and they have lots of good information at their website okay chad.org what is the quickest way if there is any to know if a study is bad as a lay person hmm, wow or unempirical or unsound that's a good question well um you, one thing you would you look at is is it in a is it is it published in a legitimate journal? So if if you go to PubMed and you can't find the paper on PubMed.gov, PubMed.gov, National Library of Medicine, if it's not there, it's very likely published in what's called a junk journal. That means it's it's a it's a scientific journal that pretends it's a journal, but it publishes anything, and anybody can you know you can pay them some money and they'll publish what you want. That's number one. Um, if it's published, and then there are different, there's different levels of the degree to which journals are reputable. That's not really the right word, I should say. Um, there's something called the impact factor of a journal. Uh, if something's published in a journal with a high impact factor, like say greater than 10, it's usually a legitimate good study, although there have been some bad studies published in, in good journals, but usually they're, they're good. Mm -hmm. um, so the impact factor is something you can use of a smaller impact factor. Certainly if it's less than one, you know, run away from it. Um, less than I would, less than two or three, I would say it's not. But, you know, there's lots of good journals that are, th are three, three or more. Otherwise, it's hard to tell if you're not an expert because some, a lot of the details, as they say, the devil is in the details. Yeah. And, um, and I, I, you know, spend a lot of time reading papers and sometimes I find articles that are just, not like the, the Moffat paper. I think the Moffat paper made some really substantial errors um, that um, led to misinterpretations. Yeah, I there was a whole uh, arc in in our kind of space about peer review itself, and just some of the studies that were emerging about the peer review process by itself, and the amount of errors that are like kind of getting through. Um, that was really really interesting. It's, it's scary. But the, the other way I can answer that question is is almost never believe what the media says about scientific findings because they're they're just trying to hype something up and it's for the most part unless it's somebody you know well and you've read a lot and you can trust them they will just take you know they'll cherry pick some finding somewhere and then turn into something that it's not i mean it's just it's it's really it can be awful i mean yeah. it's just it can be awful I, I can't tell you how many times someone as the media has said you know well in one case they said what do you think about this study i said well, whatever you do don't say this and I explained why they shouldn't say that. And it's exactly what they said, what I told them not to say. <laughs> because yeah. what I told them not to say was very sensational and, you know, was a, was a headline grabber. Right, right. Yeah, it's very interesting. I remember I remember in that uh, honors course where we were getting trained in presentations, uh, the main thing he underscored is he was like, never talk to science journalists about your science. Don't talk to journalists about your science. They'll always be wrong. And I was like... That's a little concerning that you're saying like science journalists, especially not to talk to, but it's, it's, yeah, I, I still try to talk to them to, partly to educate them. And, and they're not all bad. Some of them are very good. And mm -hmm. uh, some of them have put together good pieces and you just have to take your chances really with, with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, how many spoons do you have left? Spoons? Energy. Sorry. sorry. Energy. <laughs> <laughs> we can go to five. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Somebody asked about mushrooms, psilocybin and Adderall versus Adderall for ADHD. Any research on psilocybin with ADHD? Uh, zero. Zero. Zero research or zero evidence? Uh, zero. Zero. Well, I guess both really. Zero evidence, zero and zero research. It's just that, I mean, as far as I've never seen it studied for ADHD, it's being looked at for depression, I think, for sure. Yeah. Um, there's been some interesting results that, Usually, it's it, very frequently you see in the literature exciting results that are then never replicated. And the, the exciting result goes in the newspaper, like mindfulness for ADHD, for example. They made a big splash a few years ago, and everybody was so excited about it. And at all the national meetings, there were people presenting on it, and it just fizzled out. And it turned out, um, you know, it just was not an effective treatment. Um, somebody's wondering about diagnosis again. Um, they're concerned about, say, is it risky to watch videos about ADHD before getting diagnosed because it might prime me to give the correct answers or is watching it, some of it, a good idea to see how much of it aligns with my feelings and experiences? I would say that informing yourself about ADHD is, is a good thing. It's always a good thing to get good information about it. Um, and it, it may help you get it will give you insight because there are, there are behaviors that you might experience that you don't just even understand as being ADHD like behaviors, or you might not even mention it. In fact, we know that there are studies that, based, that's, that say that people with ADHD aren't the best adults with ADHD actually aren't the best reporters of their own symptoms that they're like their spouses sometimes are better than they are at um, reporting their symptoms of ADHD because they don't understand them that well. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I would say become informed. It's always a good thing. Yeah. Um, and ADHDevidence.org is a great location to go to for good information. Correct? Absolutely. It's the, <laughs> the go-to place to go, <laughs> which we're, we're actually now just redoing the website. It wasn't the best website, but uh, we're, we're currently redoing it, but it's, it's about all the material still available though, yeah. for people to look at. You're good at research. You're not necessarily good at website design. You got it. <laughs> um, all right. Really interesting question here. Do you think that attention seeking technology or sources of stimuli in modern society have exacerbated ADHD symptoms and its increased prevalence? So there's kind of two there, which one of them is the baked in. Is there an increased prevalence in ADHD? And then is it being caused by technology and kind of immediate stimuli? Yeah. So there's, you know, there's not been an increased prevalence that people have looked at this with, they've looked at, you know, studies are done periodically that look at, well, we have to distinguish first of all, what's called the, the true prevalence of ADHD. That's if you go out in the community and you knock on doors and you interview people and you find out about your ADHD, that's the true prevalence because you, you're asking most people about it or a good big sample of those people. Mm -hmm. And then there's the diagnosed prevalence. How many people are actually diagnosed with a disorder? So the true prevalence from the epidemiologic studies hasn't changed much at all over time. Mm -hmm. Diagnosed prevalence has gone up. There have been increases in the diagnosed prevalence, um, but that's true of almost most things. Um, and most disorders, especially once, once good treatments are available, the diagnosed prevalence goes up. So for example, in the 1960s, you know, depression was hardly diagnosed as soon as SSRIs were discovered, the prevalence, the diagnosed prevalence increased a lot, but the actual prevalence hasn't changed over time. Interesting that the, the prevalence increases actually map on. And it's also not, you know, it's, it's, it, I'm sorry about that. It's also not a, um, the idea that it's, um, I mean, I, I wrote an article once called is ADHD an American condition? Because mm -hmm. a lot of Europeans say, oh, it's America's fast paced competitive society, this, that, and the other thing. Right. And where I talk about this among other things, but even some more recent data showing that, the, you know, th there are dramatic differences in the prevalence of ADHD between high income co countries and uh, low income countries where you don't have, you know, and we're talking about countries in Africa and the Middle East and places where you don't have this high paced uh, so uh, societies. But ADHD, the ADHD and its genes have been around with us for quite a long time mm. with, without changes in the actual prevalence. Is there a connection with ADHD and personality disorders, more specifically BPD? Uh, this person had an ex with BPD and always expressed concern that they might also have ADHD. Yeah, um, it's a good concern because borderline personality is very, very difficult to treat, um, very difficult to treat. And they, those people with borderline personality tend to have 
high risk for ADHD. And ADHD is much easier to treat. It doesn't, it won't cure borderline personality, but it will help people a lot that have borderline personality. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a high comorbidity or just is it kind of the same thing where like once you have one psychiatric disorder, you're it's, it's in that same realm. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a real comorbidity. I don't know the exact percentage it's, but yes. Yeah. Okay. And, it, and even if it wasn't a real comorbidity, they still might have it. Even you know, In other words, a person, well, I guess what I would say to people is if you think you or a loved one might have ADHD, it's worth trying to find it if they do, because the treatment of it is, it's one of the, it's actually, and we've talked before, the medical treatment versus non-medical. If you look on the scale of like all medical treatments, the treatments for ADHD are as good or better than most medical treatments um, because they're just very effective treatments. It's mm -hmm. a... Yeah. Uh, last question. We did it. We got all the way through. What are your thoughts on the 15% of people who respond better to a higher uh, Levo amp and D amp ratio and how they're uh, under, underserved by most current medications? Honestly, I don't, I, I don't know of any data that support that statement right. that, I mean, for people to understand, could you describe quickly a levo amp versus a d amp ratio? Like what? It, what are well, they even asking about? So there's d amphetamine. The amphetamine, um, the amphetamine molecule contains different isomers, and we'll call them L and D, which is what they're called actually, levo and dextro amphetamine. Mm -hmm. De dextro amphetamine is believed to be the 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 act the real the active one that is helps with ADHD symptoms. Um, it's also like DNL Ritalin, the same thing that you can say for methylphenidate products. Um, the, some of the the, the the drug companies have come out with um, with molecules that have different ratios of the DNL amphetamine, different different mixtures. Right. Um, there's really no data to suggest that, at least at a at a group level, that um, futzing around with the L is helpful at all. Okay. Um, now, is it possible that some people, for some reason, do better? That's possible, but no, no data show that that's the case hmm. at, at, at all. Um, it's more likely that somebody has used a, who has used a formula that has, say, more L than another one. There's something different about that formulation, such as how long it works, or something like that, as opposed to the, it's because of the L. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, interesting. Well, that's basically all we have. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that I should have? <laughs> hey, gosh. Um, um, well, one of the questions that uh, you could ask is why, you know, why, why are, are, why are a lot of people afraid of pharmaceutical companies when it comes to ADHD? Mm. And it's, it's really, you know, it's, it, it's, it's the elephant in the room a lot with some of the discussions around the disorder, because I mentioned before, only half jokingly that, you know, people say that there's this cabal with pharmaceutical companies and experts about ADHD. And what people don't get, and, and people like me are criticized, I, consult, I do consult, I consult the companies that make drugs for ADHD, devices for ADHD all the, all the time. Right. And there's, there's some people, and I'm not talking about the public right now, I'm talking about colleagues who are like, Oh, well, that's, you know, how can we trust anything you say because you consult with these companies? And I say, well, the reason you can trust it is because the companies consult with me because they value my expertise and they think that that's useful. And that that's, a, that's a, actually a good sign that somebody's consulting with the company. It's not a, it's not a bad sign, um, but it's misunderstood a lot by the public. Um, for example, sometimes there, there was actually a, uh, um, one of the problems I've had recently with the, well, not me personally, but um, I got involved with the World Health Organization because they refused to put Ritalin on what's called the list of essential medicines for children, which seems bizarre because it's been around for so long. Um, and when we looked into it, it had to do with this um, kind of fear of the pharmaceutical industry as somehow they were manufacturing data and so forth and so on, which is which is really kind of bizarre because anybody that's ever been involved in an industry trial knows that there's some of the best run trials that are out there in terms of the, the high, the, the actual quality level of the trial. Um, anyway, I just mentioned that because it's a little bit of a, um, it's, 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 it, 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 it's, it's one of those things. I think of the things that keep people from getting treated and a lot of people, there are not a lot, but there are some people who are, who are out there thinking that, you no, know, you know, there's this, 
I can't trust the companies making these medications because it's just all the pro- it's all the profit motive. It's not actually they're not actually doing good good work. And one thing I can tell you is that the, the protocols they run are t- are, are top notch and are actually better than most that are run outside of the industry because they they have to be because they're they're supervised by the FDA so tightly uh, in a way that other trials aren't. That it's um, whereas for example studies of mindfulness, right? I mean, really half of them are just are very are incredibly poorly run trials. And yet, you know, people will, people will run to those data and say, oh, this is wonderful that this works when in fact it's, they're, they're bad. But anyway, yeah. um, that's the kind of, there's a, there needs to be a better discussion about that in the, um, in the world, I think. So we can kind of rehabilitate, <laughs> if you will, the, uh, the medical view of ADHD. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, when you're talking about these differences in the RCTs, like I think about somebody just asked me a bit about music complexity and how it treats it. And I suspect that you're going to say that there's no evidence that listening to complex music or anything treats ADHD. What are the differences in like the FDA pharmaceutical level studies on effect sizes versus something like you mentioned, like the meditation or maybe complex music? Right. So, you know, it, one good, good example being in, in an FDA trial, you have to have a control group. That, that takes a placebo medication so that the people who are rating changes in ADHD symptoms don't know who got the medication and who didn't get the medication. And that gives you a very fair uh, view of the medication's effectiveness and the adverse events. But when you look like, like let's take example for the um, studies of diet and ADHD. There have been some published in good journals that show that these very Fancy diets work f- and reduce ADHD symptoms, and it, and over a period of time, let's say we're going to make I'm going to make the number up, but something like say ten studies were done. Mm. Well, my colleagues in Europe, what they did was they looked at those ten studies, and they said, well, let's take if you look at the five studies that had good con- that were well controlled, were, were well done studies, mm. and the five that weren't well done, let's compare them. And the five studies that were poorly done all showed that diet was great for ADHD. And the five studies that were well done showed that it didn't work. Right. And and that's the problem we face is that with the FDA trials, they're they're all extremely well done because if you don't, for example, in an FDA trial, you have to say in advance, I, I think that these kids will improve on this very specific measure of ADHD. And if you happen to run your trial and you include five measures of ADHD, and they change on the four you didn't think they would change on, but not the one that you thought they would change on. The FDA would say, well, sorry, you have to do another trial because we just can't believe. I mean, you, and it has to do with statistical issues that are hard to describe. I can't really get, get into here. Yeah. Um, when you believe something's true or not um, is, uh, yeah, they're, 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 inc- they're really very rigorous trials. And I know that even the FDA gets bashed a lot in public because sometimes they make mistakes and they're they're not perfect by any means, but... Oof, the regulations they have on companies, it's, it's, I mean, it's, 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 and it's good. I mean, it's, I, I'm not complaining about it. I think it's great that the trials are so rigorous because we can really believe uh, the results that come out of them. Yeah. Okay. Well, as said, we got a minute, we ended a minute before <laughs> cut off time. Uh, thank okay. you so much. You gave us half an hour more than I was ever expecting. So I really appreciate it. I know the chat really loved it i just keep seeing that's good based. well you're 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 quite a good interviewer kyla so i enjoyed the uh, interview and uh you appreciate you kind of seeking good information which not not all interviewers do <laughs> you did a good job with that i appreciate that yeah um would you ever be interested in coming on platforms like this one like i know sure. probably if people see this they might be interested in talking to you can they give your contact would you like to come back on in like maybe six months to a year from now to talk about new research in the field? Uh, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to come back on your show, um, sure. Um, in terms of people contacting me, it's hard for me to respond to individuals. Um, I, I guess I, I get so many emails of, you know, I, I just I just can't respond to individual, you know, I have this problem, I have that problem, what can I do? I just, yes. you know, I used to, I used to do that, but it's just, if I, I just don't have the time anymore. I meant more um, content creators, like the, if there was a content creator that I know. Oh, if a content in. creator wants to, yeah, if a content creator is interested in, in, in doing an interview and having a discussion and yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'd be happy to do that. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank you so much for your time. Do you, so I can end stream now and we can talk off stream if you have any questions about the recording or if you want anything, or if you're 
good to go. You can just disconnect now. I'm going to disconnect now because I need to go. But yeah, <laughs> it was great it. talking to you, Kyla. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.